Great. Come with me, you'll get to see the part that's still under construction first. <laughs> this is our new guest house. You can see it's still on the body's putting up all the drywall. This is our wonderful new bedroom, air conditioning unit. This that you can't see right here, you can see later is the bathroom. And this is, if you were here, you could smell the cedar. These are the cedar shingles for the outside of the house. And, and back there is our wonderful new huge uh, closet. Come on. This is our wonderful new bathroom. It's all white right now. Hopefully it won't be next time you see it. <laughs> okay, come with me. This is our beautiful new deck. You can see it's kind of got footprints on it right now if you're working in the drywall. door leading into the kitchen area, which as you can see, there's a wonderful feeling of quiet and peacefulness when you come into the house. This is our um, like, uh, linen area with our washer and dryer and um, pantry and stuff. And coming into the kitchen where you can see the whole house from the kitchen. See the whole Pacific Ocean from our kitchen down to Bora Bora and uh, also the posts of our flower bed uh, boxes that are going in very soon. Our wonderful Christmas tree. And on the ceiling is our uh, new projector TV. And you can see Bob built a screen goes in the ceiling. That screen comes down six feet by eight feet. And we can see everything on as if we're in our own little movie house. The kitchen, you can see these cabinets Bob built and designed and built himself. And our microwave oven, sometimes you can see the Pacific Ocean reflected in our microwave oven. Bedroom. Our guest bedroom, I don't know how much you can see, but right now it's filled with boxes of that we're going to send your Christmas presents to you in. <laughs> Better idea of the bedroom, all the boxes, our dresser, Bob's Christmas presents. Let's see our, um, our bedroom. The first, a quick little stop off at our dining room with our wonderful new table and chairs, Christmas wreath all our beautiful Christmas decorations that are up, thanks to all our friends in the mainland. Okay, come on with me. This is my favorite part of the house. This is our wonderful new huge master bedroom. And behind you is the Pacific Ocean again. And Bobby um, designed and made this headboard himself. Maybe you noticed, it probably didn't, that it matches the chairs in our dining room. Here is another ingenious invention of uh, Bob Fish. This is our dresser and my workstation and when my computer's here you can just sit here and work away and look out the uh, living room and the Pacific Ocean and uh, have your time. Right. This is a wonderful poster I got for my birthday. Uh, this is the best part of our new master bedroom is our bathroom. This shower that goes on forever, two person shower. and skylight. And the best thing of all is this sauna. If you were here, you could smell it. And you could probably see it too. <laughs> so that concludes this portion of the Fish House on Parade. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Fishmas! <laughs> by my moose, this is Elise Moose, who's come to live with us, courtesy of Lauren and Henry Darrow. Uh, next, you're going to see the uh, original, uncut, unexpurgated uh, version of the Tom Selleck film, which aired on The David Letterman Show, December 26, 1985. So I hope you enjoy it. You're wonderful, Tom! Morning, Mike. Well? 10 a.m. sharp. Good morning, Mr. Slick. Sorry we had to bring you in so early today. Oh, that's all right. What a wonderful guy. You're wonderful, Tom. Let's see. I'll just put something on the stereo here. Yes? Mr. Slick, they're ready for you, sir. Oh, I'll be right out. Thank you, sir. This is my mobile dressing room.
It isn't much, but we call it home. Well, I better go outside. They're all waiting for me, and I have to go to work. You're wonderful, Tom. Ah! Folks, listen. Oh, please, listen. I have to go to work now, but I'll come out on my own time and sign an autograph for each and every one of you, and then I'll pose for an individual picture with all of you. Thank you, folks. You are wonderful, Tom. You're wonderful, Tom. Oh, thank you, Robin. Hi, Tom. Charles and the staff just wanted to say good night. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Shall I just go right in? Why don't you go right in? They're waiting for you. Okay. Well, hi, Tom. Hey, I saw the daisy. God, you, oh. you're wonderful. Oh, Tom, never looked better in your life. Everything looks wonderful. Oh, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Bruce. Hi, guys. Hi, Tom. Oh, hi. Oh, hi there. Oh. Oh, 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 I get so embarrassed when you do that every oh. day. Oh, it's terrific, so Tom. Wonderful. Listen, Tom, what time would you like to come to work in the morning? Oh, I don't know, Charles. Whatever's best for you. Oh, any time you want to do it. Thank Fine. you. Beer, Tom? Oh, thank you, Reuben. Here you are. Gee, we've been working really hard on the rewrite, Tom. I, I hope you like it. I, I think it's pretty good. Oh, thanks, like Chris. It. I'll just pick it up in the morning. Oh, okay. I'm going to go home and get ready for tomorrow's work. Okay. Oh, Tom, you're wonderful. You're wonderful, Tom. And then I did the Letterman show. Morning, Mike. Morning, Macy. Some ID, please. Sure, I think I got some somewhere here. Tom, um, it. here it is, right here. As you can see, Dave, um, there's been a few changes here. I'm coming. I'm coming. Are you ready yet? Yes, I'm coming. Here he comes. Yes, Here he comes. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Listen, everybody, I won't have time for any autographs right now. I have to go to work. But I'll come out on my own time and sign an autograph for each and every one of you and pose for a, an individual picture. Oh, <laughs> you're wonderful, you're Tom. Wonderful. Hi, Robin. Hi, Jerry. I just came by to say good night. Everyone's real busy right now, Tom. Oh, well, that's okay. I can wait. Tom, you're wonderful. You're wonderful, Tom. You're wonderful, Tom. Good night, Tom. We love you. Thank you. Hey! Hmm? You know who this is? It's Magnum. Oh, yeah. Haven't I seen you on the Letterman show? Listen, could you get me a picture of Bill Cosby? Did you get me one, too? Hmm? Next, what you're going to see are some uh, outtakes.
outtakes uh, or unusable footage that we shot during the year on Magnum PI. How are you doing, Higgins? Anything from Rick or TC? Unfortunately, no. At least not in any positive sense. However, Rick did call an hour ago to say that the chaps at the Chop Chop had no idea how to reach the houseboys who ditched the Continental. It's homeboys. Well, at least it looks like you're making some progress. Yes, quite. As insignificant as it may seem under the circumstances. However, it does provide some mental relief, if not stimulation, exactly. For instance, this book I... <laughs> I saw that. TC, you gotta help me. I already helped you. I kicked in for airfare and expenses for Thomas to get your money. Now, I got to split. And I could go to my job and try to make some money. <laughs> and what else? <laughs> He's so fine. Are you ready now? No! <laughs> See? Death. Keep going. Go back and forth. No! It's like, it. no. <laughs> like a duck gallery. <laughs> See, when I hit him, you're supposed to go back the other way. <laughs> <laughs> and when I hit him again, you go, whoop, whoop, whoop. Sorry. I lost my head. Is this what you want to do? Oh, cut it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the bells in later. What about the cat man? What about the jewelry design convention tomorrow? Don't beg. It's unseemly. I'm not begging. Of course not. As far as the so-called cat man goes, Hopefully, your amateurish ruse has worked. <laughs> You're really sick. Cut. Where was I? And action. Come on. Where are you going? Keep running. Action. Come on. Where are you going? <laughs> I can do it. This is the best way, because yeah, if you is. stop, I'll get be worse. Ah, here they are. Death among friends, death at Lord's, death before bedtime, death by dreaming. <laughs> what, what, is, what, what are you doing in there? What is he doing? I mean... Easy, fella. <coughs> Come on, I just... <laughs> All right, hold, hold Bobby Douglas. Come in with your cue cards, please. Cue okay. cards from Mr. Minor. Well, I wish you stunt guys could remember their lines.
crew. I was acting. I'm gonna get it. Freeze! Police! Everybody's got their specialty, I guess. If I boost cars, you boost state secrets. Maybe. Maybe you weren't really stealing that Mercedes. Maybe you were planning something on me. That's good. That's real good. <sighs> but it's not gonna stick. Put the blame on somebody else, huh? I can invert these lines, Tom, and you won't fucking believe it, see? <laughs> Thank my mom, <laughs> my dad, and my sisters, and my piano teacher. Look, if you really are her, her security man, you know, the guy who watches her bodyguards and watches out, you want me to say that again? Yeah. I think it's okay to have idols. I mean, I grew up wanting to hit like Hank Greenberg, so it's okay if you want to grow up to be Humphrey Wugut. Now, did, did you ever tell, did Garwood Jr. or any of his relatives, or little Garwood, or the big tall one? <laughs> Look, if you really are her security man, why aren't you guarding her? Why aren't you doing your job? Why you... <laughs> no, wait a minute. Thomas, we'll look for the later, letter, later. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can't keep me here. Well, you try and leave, Lieutenant. You'll Tanaka will stop you as men all around. Yeah. The <laughs> there. Oh, Thomas. I, uh... I, I'm so glad to see you. The police are here. They think Jeff was... <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have to own up. Are you so shocked that he has enemies? Frankly, I never thought of such a man having friend or foe. <gasps> Donald. Are you suggesting? Suggesting? No, my dear. I am merely stating a fact that the Colonel is deeply resented in high places. <laughs> Go ahead. Make my day. Come on. Where are you going? To get a hot dog. <laughs> hey, friend, that one. All right, let's go. I worked in the rehearsal. Where are you going? To test how acute my sense of human nature is. <laughs> Easy, fella. <coughs> Come on. <laughs> I just work here.
Dr. Challenger, Houston here. We've uh, got a string of green mints floating in the ocean down there. It's the Hawaiian Islands. Next orbit, we'll start the Mount Aloha Solar Observatory experiment. Roger, that is a go. Our next landfall is now on the west coast, 2,200 nautical miles east. Okay, Challenger, Houston out. KHPO Hilo with the Dawn Patrol. It's 129 this Sunday morning, March 25th. Here are the Beach Boys. In the nighttime stillness of Mauna Kea, a jolt shakes an observatory, causing astronomers to lose track of a star. They place calls to the neighboring summit at Kilauea to reach the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Morning dispatch. Morning. The jolt is the latest of several that began just a few hours ago and they are centered beneath Mauna Loa, within the Big Island's Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Swarms of micro-earthquakes building to larger ones are the precursors to a sudden glow in the night. They announce the long-anticipated eruption of the world's largest shield volcano, where, for the past several years, scientists have implanted an extensive network of eavesdropping instruments. Mauna Loa, after rumbling briefly in the night, awakens after a restless repose of nine years. It is March 25th, 1984. For the next 21 days, a pent-up power in the Earth drives more than 200 million cubic meters of magma from an internal sea, a mass sufficient to pave a highway to the moon. Despite this outpouring of nature's gifts, its contribution to Mauna Loa's growth is less significant than the addition of a single page to a thousand telephone books. Perhaps tens of thousands of pages more remain to be added. This Sunday morning, the eruption begins near the volcano's summit of 13,677 feet, within the scoop-shaped caldera called Mokua Veo Veo. For a few hours, fountains of lava dance higher than 30-story buildings. Like an artery drawn open with a scalpel, eruptive fissures open on the southwest rift zone. Soon after, another artery begins to bleed on the northeast flank, and still another. Although the dancing fountains at Mauna Loa's summit begin to shut down, the volcanic pot will continue to refill itself from deep within the earth for the next several days its fissures spilling lava from its cracked sides at elevations of 11,200 feet and 9,400 feet. But just where is this molten soup of rock coming from here in the northern Pacific Ocean? To start from the top, scientists believe the Earth's crust is not a rigid skin, but instead made up of large plates like the shell of a turtle. But unlike the turtle, these plates are slowly drifting upon a mantle of nearly molten rock. Our continents, with their plains and mountains, and our oceans, with their islands, drift like crackers on the surface of a low, simmering soup. When a crustal plate of the ocean abuts a crustal plate of a continent, nature shudders. Pressure subducts or forces down the thinner ocean plate beneath its continental neighbor. The continental plate buckles, heaving up great mountain ranges. Molten rock beneath the plate, hotter and thus lighter than the cold rocks above, ascends at the plate's ruptured edges. Volcanoes erupt. In the Pacific, the edges of the plate have become tagged as the ring of fire. And Hawaii, sitting far removed from the edges of these gnashing plates, it is believed that the Big Island sits atop a stationary hot spot far below the moving crustal plate, a hot spot perhaps 40 miles down within the Earth's mantle. As if placed above a conduit to a blowtorch, volcanoes erupt when the hot spot generates a sufficient amount of magma. Meanwhile, the Pacific plate carries Mauna Loa and the rest of the Hawaiian Islands toward the northwest at three or four inches a year, perhaps some 660 feet since the time of Christ perhaps one mile every 16,000 years. Eventually, the upper plumbing breaks away from the immovable hotspot below. The volcano falls dormant, then extinct, drifting majestically toward the Aleutians. Yet, relentlessly, magma buoys its way upward, 
new plumbing is created, and emerging on the ocean floor, a new volcano or seamount is born. Tens of thousands of years later, still growing, it may pierce the surface to become an island. It is day two of Mauna Loa's enormous eruption, its conduit to the unseen maker of magma deep within the earth flowing freely. In Hawaii's lexicon of gods and goddesses, it is Pele, goddess of fire, who has arranged the volcano's internal plumbing to tap her element and send it roaring down the mountain at momentary speeds up to 35 miles an hour. Scientists at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, like explorers in a strange land, measure the fiery spectacle. They look for patterns, for the plot line, for the major character in Pele's drama that began millions of years ago with millions of years to follow before her final curtain. My name is Richard Moore. I'm a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. We're standing at a small satellitic shield that's being built about 500 meters downrift from the main vent of this 1984 Mauna Loa eruption. I'm holding a thermocouple and a meter. The thermocouple is made of chromel alumel alloy. It measures temperatures up to about 1,200 degrees centigrade. I insert the thermocouple in the lava. Its temperature about one hour ago was 1,140 degrees centigrade. There are two principal reasons that we measure the temperatures. One is to determine if the temperature has risen so that the lava being emitted might be more fluid and thus constitute a greater hazard down slope. The other reason is that a field of geology called igneous metrology is, is concerned with understanding the crystallization of specific minerals at, uh, at different temperatures in the lava. The lava forms channels like rivers of water. Within the first 24 hours, the main flow advances eight miles down the northeast flank. The river swells to depths of 15 feet at temperatures of 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. It descends to an elevation of 6,200 feet. Pele's plot emerges in outline fashion. First, an eruption at the summit caldera, a red ribbon placed on edge, a curtain of fire as high as the Statue of Liberty, as long as New York's Central Park. Eight hours later, another major episode, as a vent outbreak occurs farther down the mountain at an elevation of 11,200 feet. Another seven hours later, a vent outbreak again, this time at 9,400 feet. This is how Pele has turned on her crimson plumbing system. At the latest vent, lava fountains and flows down the northeast rift for the next 20 days. This becomes the principal source of lava for the remainder of the entire eruption, the main tap. Every hour, nearly a million cubic yards of magma buoys its way from ancient residents in the deep, unseen hotspot Enough mass every 60 minutes to fill an area the size of Disneyland to a depth of nearly 10 feet, 24 hours a day. Media representatives from around the world begin to arrive at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, as do spectators, and National Park Rangers go to work to turn back the overzealous. Danger remains real in a major eruption of the world's largest shield volcano. More patterns become clear. The feeding rivers soon cool on the surface and crust over in places, sometimes developing more or less continuous roofs. Beneath the crust, the lava sometimes glides through tubes of its own making. Eventually, most of the molten lava may drain away, leaving open tunnels. Although tunneling doesn't occur in this eruption, when lava tubes do occur, they often resemble subway tunnels as much as 20 feet in diameter. Still other themes of Pele's play emerge. Her volcanoes produce two kinds of lava. One is pahoehoe, smooth and ropey in appearance. The other is aa, rough and craggy. Each is composed of exactly the same materials, but because of their temperature and gaseous contents, they assume strikingly different forms upon cooling. Hours pass and the principal vent shows no signs of abating. 
It creates channels bounded by levees. Flows of a'a -a splay into toes and encroach on power line poles, burning them as casually as matchsticks. Fountains of feathery plumes arch skyward, the height of tall buildings forming spatter cones beneath them. Curiously, as if demanding sovereignty over the heavens as well, Pele cuts the power to the Mauna Loa Solar Observatory, a part of the National Center for Atmospheric Research. At the same time, the Challenger astronauts are orbiting above to repair a satellite transmitter, collecting data for Mauna Loa scientists. Emergency generators thwart an extension of Pele's hegemony. In terms of a geological clock, the modern notions of how volcanoes work took shape barely a moment ago. We are at a point where we are still dazed by the light. But the need to explain these forces is as old as the human race. The spectacle of an eruption causes wonder and fear as certainly as Pele taps her magma. Just a couple of geological moments ago, early Hawaiians attributed eruptions to their goddess's movements as she searched the island chain to dig a deep pit to house her fiery family. Hitchcock, Verneau, and other turn-of-the-century painters sometimes saw Pele as they captured her ageless drama. The Hawaiians were excellent observers. Her travels, as accounted for in their traditions, correspond to the history of volcanic activity in Hawaii as we know it today. Day five and molten lava twists down its channels, red hot coals on a conveyor belt. Other patterns come into focus. Molten rivers overflow their channels and spread to become ponds. The rivers now slither a distance of 16 miles and descend to an elevation of 3,200 feet. Like layers of crinoline filling Mauna Loa's skirts, lava flows into a forest of native ohia trees. Burning vegetation and entrapped water produce methane and hydrogen explosions. Scientists test the gaseous content of the lava, looking for clues about temperature and what lies ahead. On this day, the widening flow travels less than a mile. But now, 25 miles to the east of the Mauna Loa caldera, another player enters Pele's vast stage at Kilauea Volcano, also in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. A mere child, one-third the height of Mauna Loa, Kilauea traditionally is more restless and active than her older neighbor, turning in more than 60 eruptive performances since the early 1800s. Today, six days after Mauna Loa has come to life, Kilauea also stirs and then erupts. For the first time in 65 years, two of Hawaii's volcanoes are erupting simultaneously. Typically, shield volcanoes begin with a swelling within, then often produce one or more eruptions at their summit, followed by eruptions at fissures on their flanks, accompanied by internal deflation. In 1790, and again in 1924, Kilauea created violent explosive eruptions, similar to, but smaller than, Mount St. Helens in 1980, breaking the pattern of gentle eruptions associated with shield-type volcanoes. For this episode, Kilauea sends a river rushing down its east flank without a display of explosions. The event lasts 22 hours and strengthens the theory that Mauna Loa and Kilauea each has its own subsurface plumbing system, that each is related independently to Hawaii's hotspot miles below in the mantle. The idea gains credibility because Kilauea's eruption has no discernible effect upon Mauna Loa's output of lava. 
So scientists, having to study a book whose cover they can never open, believe that magma is derived from the crust and upper mantle of the Earth, not from its core. By some process, perhaps the decay of radioactive elements such as uranium and thorium, concentrated heat melts upper mantle rocks, and it streams upward through conduits to collect in reservoirs a mile or two beneath the surface. Mounting pressure within the reservoirs forces magma or melted rock to erupt, sometimes, but not always, at a volcano's summit. Pelle then often shepherds her elements through fractures, along rift zones appearing farther down the flanks of the mountain. Such an intrusion of magma into Mauna Loa followed the 1975 eruption and apparently set the stage for the current eruption. After pressure is relieved by eruption, lava drains from beneath the caldera, flowing more vigorously into rift zones, and the floor of the bowl-shaped crater subsides. Like the heaving chest of a giant, Mauna Loa swells and collapses, 39 pulsating episodes of volcanic eruptions since about 1790. Day 18, and millions of cubic yards of lava spiral out of the main vent. Long ribbons of lava on the flanks clearly outline the course of Mauna Loa's flows. Is Pele showing any signs of relaxing? What is happening with the pressures of the magma reservoir within? Temperatures are probed. And measurements taken to detect subsurface magnetic changes. The main channel now is becoming increasingly blocked by debris from its levees on either side. New rivulets form, slowing the advance of the older flow front. Finally, nearly three weeks after awakening, Mauna Loa finds its flow of lava unable to clear new channels. As if spent and seeking to slumber, the volcano dwindles in activity to intermittent ooze-outs. And on April 15th, 22 days from its beginning, the eruption is declared officially over. Measurements are taken of her new girth, this has been a relatively brief spasm. The longest recorded eruption of Mauna Loa began in 1873 and continued for more than a year and a half. But 1984 marks the first time that sensitive instrumentation captures the volcano's complete eruptive cycle from initial stirrings to full fury to fitful sleep once again. Data from this event will become the baseline against which all of Pele's future exploits are measured. Her flow contributed 218 million cubic meters of new material to the Earth's surface. It covers 47.7 square kilometers, more than 18 square miles, nearly 12,000 acres, an expanse greater than the size of Anchorage, Alaska. But these are insignificant numbers. We are like children before such forces, applauding a few mere gestures within a brief scene of an act that's only begun within a play that is booked to run for millions of years and that began millions of years ago.